All right. Hello, everybody. Hi. How's everyone doing? Welcome to our live video with the two of us. We decided to do an impromptu live video because we were getting a lot of questions about um, jazz, improvisation, and theory. So we kind of just wanted to talk about why those things are helpful. So surprise, you get a live video from us. Hooray. So if you're watching, feel free to comment, say, you know, where you're watching from, what instrument you play. So we're Amanda and Anna, if you're new to our Facebook group, and we have a program called Virtual Woodwind Academy. I play clarinet and sax, and Amanda is our flute instructor. And we love donuts and went to Oberlin together. That pretty much sums it up. <laughs> um, we also have some interesting donut related pictures that are going to be dropping soon on this page, so stay tuned. Yes. Um, but yeah, today we wanted to talk about um, theory and improvisation. So music theory, what happens when I say music theory in your brain? Do you think, oh, what is that? Or, oh, <laughs> that sounds boring. Or, oh, that means I have to buy a textbook, right, and study it? Um, no. So truthfully, music theory okay was something that we had to take all throughout college like literally every single semester and then we had to do advanced electives like one class that i took was studying like like stravinsky's music like down to like every single note figuring out how he wrote it and stuff and you know people have to take music theory in music schools and it's not always the most exciting and the most applicable like stravinsky didn't even write any music for flute yeah, he wrote orchestral music that I sometimes played. Um, but besides that, it really like didn't help improve my playing. But there were parts of music theory that after I left college, I was like so grateful I knew about. And these are the types of things that we actually want to talk about today because they're the types of things that are going to really improve your playing. So Anna, what are some music theory topics you find applicable to your musical studies and playing today? Yeah. Well, honestly, I think it just makes things so much easier and more fun when you like kind of understand what is going on with the music that you're playing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like kind of the right. harmony or structure of it. And like, I feel like it just makes things easier. Um, no matter like what genre you're playing. Um, so just kind of like understanding what's going on in the music, especially like when you're in band class, like being like, oh, okay, this is like, the tense moment because there's like this chord here or another thing um that's really important too is knowing how phrases work and knowing how harmony kind of like works with these phrases makes it easier to be like okay this is how i can shape this musically instead of being like what is this <laughs> you know how do i play it it just it just helps make playing more fun honestly um and understand more about what you're doing it really does it really like just adds a whole deeper level of meaning to your music. Cause like without music theory, without understanding the structure and essentially like why those notes are written the way they are, it's just notes on the page and we're just reading it. Um, but you know, music is about communicating. We're communicating feelings and thoughts and ideas to each other in this universal language that we can all understand. And when you understand music theory, then what you're saying with your music actually really mean something and that's what's so life-changing about it yeah that was beautiful amanda thank you <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I also think it's like important to um i was just thinking about this yesterday actually um how like music theory is like a way of explaining like what's going on with the music it's not like someone was like let's come up with all these rules and then like compose the music. Like music theory is kind of our way of understanding like what's going on with the music. Um, you know, yeah. so it's all about just understanding the music you, pl you play and not like, I don't know. I feel like people teach music theory in kind of a boring way nowadays and we're all about teaching it in a fun way that makes it actually relate to your music. Yeah. <laughs> no That's scary we... textbooks. And we also like, we also just took out all of the most important concepts 
that are the most applicable to your playing. Like, for example, like doing like chants of like seven notes over three notes, like while you're snapping three and then singing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Like, that's what we did in music theory, like for semesters. And, you know, obviously that's not the most applicable to band music because how often do you have to play around a seven? Like, there are better ways to go about chanting something like that. For example, um, yeah, I actually wanted to like kind of, I'm like looking at a piece of music one of my students was working on. And I was like thinking about some of the questions they asked me. Um, and basically something that happens is like, oh, why is, why did the composer have to write such a high note there? Or why did they make this run so hard? Or like, I don't have anywhere to breathe. People ask those questions a lot. And when you understand music theory, you'll, you might see that, you know, the, that high note there is a high E flat. We're playing an E flat major. That's the high point of the piece, like kind of where like the most energy is. And you need to kind of hold that out a little bit and not be scared to play it loud. Cause just because it's a high note doesn't mean it's hard. It's like the high point of the piece, you know? Um, understanding that like gives you, gives you, empowers you to just go for it and play it. And then not knowing where to breathe, that is very easily fixable if you know what the phrase structure is. So if you know like, oh, like after these two measures, there's a half cadence. And even though I don't have any rest to breathe on, that's a good place for the music to breathe by itself. And I could take a quick breath there. Um, and as far as like a, a difficult run, like this, this comes up a lot with my students who play like really difficult marches in band. I don't want to call anyone out, but there is this, <laughs> there's this march out there called the Gillette March, which is razor sharp and apparently razor hard. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really hard. Like looking at it, there's all these runs in it. And if you understand music theory, you understand like the purpose of the run. Like it's not like the composer just sat there and wrote like a bunch of crap on the page and was just like, hey, 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 you know, doing this hard thing. <laughs> and, well, sometimes they do, but usually not. <laughs> usually, well, maybe with the altissimo range of the clarinet, they did, but. Um, <laughs> There's a purpose to it. And when you know that purpose, you can kind of like simplify it a little. <laughs> Maybe you don't need to play all of those notes, you know, because like all the run is doing is basically building energy and you can build on energy in other ways. So anyway, there's just so many ways that music theory like really just makes our playing so much easier. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, and then I guess we can kind of talk about, because I know we had some questions kind of like about improvisation and how that kind of relates to your playing and music theory and all that good stuff too. So on a why even learn improvisation? Like, to be is cool. it necessary for like, <laughs> like people who just play in band or something? Like, yeah. is it necessary for them to learn it? So I think it is. And that is... Um, if you know us, we've been sending emails about it, and some people are like, oh, how can you even suggest that I, as a classical musician, learn improvisation? Um, <laughs> and we think that's the wrong attitude. <laughs> so a little bit of backstory about me and Amanda. So we, so I think this is very relevant to the story. You probably have heard this, but whatever. Um, so we met at Oberlin and we were like friends, but we weren't like best friends. And then we became best friends because I saw that Amanda was offering flute lessons. So I took flute lessons for Amanda and Amanda was like, oh, I've always like kind of wanted to improve my jazz improv. So she took jazz improv lessons with me and now we're both amazing at both. <laughs> we're mostly amazing. Um, anyway. So that was like so important to her as a classical musician to develop that skill. Um, and my background is in, I'm a, I was a classical and jazz double major. And I think when people think of improvisation, I think they think like, sometimes people think like atonal jazz or just like really hard jazz music that seems like way, you know, outside of their abilities to play like really fast, like Charlie Parker stuff. Um, or just like, I think people have different ideas of jazz. Um, and like, I feel like improvisation and jazz can be so many things. 
Um, and the way we teach improvisation is like, so what is improvising? Let's talk about that first. So what does improvising mean to you, Amanda? Okay, so um, <laughs> this is probably different than your definition, but- That's cool. When I'm improvising, I'm thinking of myself as the composer. So, mm. you know, when I have these like weird, like classical music pieces where I have to like, not weird, I'm so sorry, not weird, but like, you know, just reading off the music. <laughs> And I'm like, why is this run here? Why is this rest here? Why is this note here? Like, that's the composer just thinking of things to write, and they wrote it down. And when you're improvising, you get to decide how hard your music is. And if you listen to, like, Miles Davis, for example, great example of somebody who doesn't play that many notes but still communicates so much meaning. That's like, beautiful. you get to play, like, one note, and it's just, like, yeah, that was amazing, you know? And, you know, obviously there are other jazz musicians that are all like, duh, 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 like all the time. <laughs> um, but like, it's all your preference. Like, that's what they like to do. Um, you can, Miles Davis is super famous. Like, you could draw from that. And that's where I drew from too when I was learning improvisation because I wanted to like make an impact with my music without having to play tons and tons of notes just so I could really like focus on how it sounded and what I like to play and what I thought sounded good. Um, so yeah, improvisation really like, I think means that I get the freedom to decide what I play. And it kind of makes me feel special <laughs> because I'm playing something that I wrote. And it, to be honest, like once you just know the simple chords that we talked about in the jazz class last week, you can create something like it's not something that's difficult like we think like oh we have to like be one of these people that learned jazz by ear since the time we were two years old like no you don't need that Anna has a really simple great way of teaching it that makes everyone able to do it um and I, I frankly think that like improvisation is gonna just continue like becoming more and more popular and eventually everyone's gonna have to do it yeah, Amanda, that was great. I think that's so cool. I love the whole like improvisation is composing because that's that's really what it is. And we even talked about how like classical musicians, there used to be a long standing tradition of composing and improvisation that just isn't really done. We talk about like how the Mozart clarinet concerto, the cadenza is like composed. Like people would just like, I mean, you know, obviously it's not in a jazz style, but people were creating something over it. And then like Bach was creating stuff, you know? Um, and I feel like that helped make the music more creative. Um, and yeah. Um, and, and something that's also helped me too is like, so, um, you know, I, I compose now. So I'm releasing an album, a jazz classical album actually later this summer. Um, and I composed all the, all the tunes and I didn't actually like set out to be a composer, but through like improvisation, I like composed a piece for a string quartet, um, you know, and I feel like I've kind of found my own voice. So I don't know, improvisation might open some new doors that you even thought about. Um, but at the very least, it'll make you feel more kind of free and expressive, um, in what you're playing. And actually, yeah, go, go for it. Go for it. Um, like I was just thinking back before before I started taking improv lessons with you, like that was kind of later on in my musical career. Mm. Obviously I had already graduated with my master's, I was already playing professionally, and I was just like looking for a new spark, something fun to try, something that was just for me that like, and I wanted to one day, I still want to do this, but hey COVID, <laughs> do like wedding bands and stuff. I think that'd be amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, even so, like before I learned all this, while I was in college studying classical music, I had to be doing improv and I like had no idea how to do it. And it was just the most frustrating and difficult thing about my musical studies. And guys, let me know if you guys have had to do this yet. Um, the players, when they play music by Bach, have to write in ornamentation. So if you have like a melody that gets you a repeat sign, when you take the repeat sign, you have to add in ornamentation. So you're adding in trills, you're adding in random 16th notes, you're adding in little turns, you're adding in grace notes, you're adding in stuff to kind of further emphasize the music and make it your own. 
And I was so frustrated with doing that. I was like listening to recordings and writing down what other people did and copying it. I was asking my teacher to write it for me. And they were telling me, oh, this is like what my teacher used. And it can change. You can change your mind. And I was like, I don't know how to change my mind. I don't even know what's going on in the music. It's just hard. And this is hard. Yeah. Another thing I had to do was write my own Mozart flute concerto cadenza. Because <laughs> that's something that, like, if you write your own cadenza, people are like, oh, man, that was amazing. And, you know, back in Mozart's time, people did write their own cadenza. Like, that was normal. And that's and, the know, thing that got transcribed and ended up in, like, the auditions that we It did. took me months. Yeah. And it <laughs> wasn't something I even liked playing because, like, my teacher wrote it for me. So now, now that I've learned improv, even from the jazz standpoint, like, it, it just, like, really helped me be more creative and really trust myself and feel more confident. And I, I just do ornamentation on the spot now. I don't even plan it out. And I love it. And as far as the Mozart concerto cadenzas go... Um, this is my reminder to go ahead and write a new one, but I bet it's going to sound amazing. Yeah. And I'm actually looking forward to doing it. So, yeah. Yay. That's great. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's, I mean, there's so many benefits of both like theory and improv and there's so, I feel like we're kind of finding out through talking, like how related they are, like knowing the chords helps make you more musical. And that's like, I mean, that's literally why we're teaching about it. <laughs> because like, you know, we wouldn't teach this stuff if we didn't think it was helpful. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so, and then like, I, I think also, so kind of like with improvisation, um, kind of like how I teach it, like Amanda in our lessons, like we started playing right away. We weren't just like, let's analyze this song. We we're like, let's do it. And you know, there's, um, you can start, like, improvising right away, um, you know, and there's, there's, like, some jazz standards that are, like, you know, easier chord-wise, um, or harmony-wise to kind of be able to play over, so it doesn't have to be scary or daunting or feeling like you're not good enough or anything like that. Cool. Beautiful. Yeah. I feel like we could talk about this for, like, an hour. <laughs> We could, and we will probably talk about more later. Um, does anyone watching this have any questions about, like, how theory or improv can help your playing, or, like, maybe any of their experiences with theory or improv? Okay. Awesome. Well, cool. Um, hopefully you found that helpful, and hopefully if you have any questions about how this stuff can actually help your playing, um, that kind of answered them. Did you have anything to add, Amanda? I guess not. Um, we are in the midst of Woodland Academy right now, enjoying it. We're in month one. Month two starts in two weeks. Exciting. A little less than two weeks now. And month two is music theory. So we got music theory on the brain. After that is improv. We got improv on the brain. And we just wanted to drop in and share our two cents about all of those things. Yep. Yeah, and we have, um, it's really cool. We've been working with, how many people do we have? Do we have 18 people? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's amazing. We have like the coolest adults <laughs> in our program right now. We're honestly having a blast. We're having a blast. Yes. Yeah, this month is all about effective practice strategies. We've been working on how to, like, optimize practice routines um, and working on tone. Um, Doing a lot of that drone practice to improve intonation. And, oh, my gosh, one of – I don't know if I should call him out, but one of my students in virtual with the academy <laughs> sent me recordings of the drone. And last night he sent me these recordings of him playing, and they were just, like – they were in tune. It like made me smile. I was like, oh my gosh, that sounds so good. Are you hearing that? I'm still waiting for a reply. You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. No. Um, so, it's awesome. It's awesome to see people really improving and enjoying it and, um, you know, learning from each other and meeting other people like them. We got a whole bunch of people randomly from Maryland. Um, and we're just there like talking about the Ravens and like, 
um, the weather because we randomly have some cool weather here right now, which never happens. And it's just awesome. So yeah, we're having a blast. So that's why we haven't been posting as much because we've been really working hard, you know, focusing on that, making sure everyone's feeling good and learning <laughs> all their music stuff. Um, cool. Well, I hope you enjoy our video. We'll be popping in again at some point. Um, let us know if you have any questions about what we said, and hopefully you got some new ways to think about your practicing. Bye, guys. Bye.